Okay, so another person sent me their Nintendo M82 kiosk unit to fix. Now this is a regular NTSC version. It does have a different type of uh, solder mask and flow, but it's basically the same thing. Uh, now I've already installed my IRQ mod and I've tested that to be working. I also went in and reflowed all of the pin connectors, all 72 times 12 uh, joints. There were a few that looked cold, but I'm still getting graphical glitches. Not with the built-in ROM, you know, the demo that tells you what the thing is, but actually with the games themselves. So what I'm going to do, for starters, is play a game and look at the graphical glitches and use that to determine what actually is wrong. Yeah, look at these weird glitches. Hmm, interesting. The data is, like, if you look at here, like, you can see, like, 1987. The characters are coming across the bus. Well, the data bus is correct, but I believe the addressing portion is wrong. It looks like you can you can kind of see the shape, but it looks like it's um, repeating vertically, which is the way the data is arranged in memory. Yeah, some, something with the bits in the data address. Okay, so like here we can see the trees. You can kind of see them. And Mega Man, he looks like Mega Man. Oh, it's icy. The sprites are all correct, which makes sense because the sprite pointers and positional data is stored in a separate area of memory on the PPU itself. Now what you'll notice here, see as I move how things are popping into view? So what happens with these scrolling games is there's uh, basically, well, at least on this cartridge, there's two banks of memory. There's what's on screen and what's off screen. And as you scroll, the CPU is redrawing new areas into RAM ahead of you before you get to them. See that? But the fact that those things being drawn into RAM are appearing before they should also points to a data address issue. If you look at it, the left-hand side of the screen is where the erroneous updates are being drawn, but the right-hand side of the screen, despite being glitched, the tiles are actually in the right place. You can see the normal geometry. From the awesome site, nestdev.com, and here, are the memory maps or basically, you know, descriptions of where memory locations are for the PPU, the picture processing unit. So um, yeah, there's actually 256 uh, bytes inside the PPU, which controls the sprites. And we know those are working because the sprites are appearing in the right place, but it's this uh, part that's not working. So we have pattern table zero and pattern table one. So that's going to be uh, background characters and then uh, sprite characters. Then we have the name tables, and uh, typically you only have two of these unless the cartridge has an additional 2K of RAM for four-way scrolling. So we saw that the name table was not updating correctly, like the left half of it wasn't working right, and also the pattern table was messed up. But it was partially working, which makes me think it's something with the address bus. Here's a schematic of a normal Nintendo. I call it a Nintendo because I'm a Gen Xer. Here's the PPU. Now if you notice, we have uh, 13 address lines. So it's AD 0 through 7 and then PA 8 through 13. So what the Nintendo is doing is it's actually using a buffer, which is uh, right down here, to uh, swap out the data lines. So it's actually using the first eight uh, address lines to also act as data lines. And then it switches using this buffer over here. And then this chip right here, that's the RAM. But if something with the address line isn't working correctly, it will also address the incorrect portions of RAM, which is why we're seeing the name table issues. Yeah, so obviously there's only one RAM chip on the entire, or at least one video RAM chip on the M82, which is a 2K RAM. So, you know, that doesn't change. And we know that the boot up screen looks okay. So I guess my question is um, this buffer here, the LS373, I wonder if they have one of those for every cartridge and that's how they actually are doing the bank switching or if they just have a master one right in front of the PPU and then they do all the, you know, cartridge switching after the fact, which would be on this side. All right, so here's the nestdev.com page about the name tables. And over here in the corner, you can see them. Now, in Mega Man, for instance, we were scrolling horizontally, so, well, it's mirrored. But so basically, you know, one, you know, you're looking at the 2000 hex range, and then you're scrolling into the 2400 hex range, right? But then we noticed it was usually the left hand side of the screen that was being updated incorrectly. So if we look at the indexes, that could show us, you know, what part of the data bus is being corrupted. Ah, uh, yeah. So let's think about this. Let's get the trusty calculator, which loads slower in Windows 10 than it did in the past. I'm going to go Alt-3 for programmer mode. Okay. So let's type, let's go to hex. All right, hex. All right, hex 2000. All right. 
So let's see. Uh, the thing to look at are is the the binary representation, which is that, right? So that's you know you have the first eight bits, and then you have these uh, upper six bits. Oh darn it. Okay. So what would change? So we see that it looks like that. So let's do this. Let's just open another calculator because I you know I have this handy calculator button on my uh, Windows keyboard that I'll never get rid of. Let's type in 2400 hex, which would be the next display. And then if we compare these, we can see that it's pretty much the same except for that bit there has changed. See? That the error might be in the um, uh, bits, what would that, bits 8 through 12? That might be where the error lies. Because it's pointing to the right area of memory to show the name tables, but it's not updating them correctly. Here's the cartridge pinout for the Nintendo, but that's the Famicom because there's only 60. So we go down to the American one. It's basically the same except for there's expansion in the middle. PPU A0 to 6, 7 up to 13. Well, wait a second. Pattern table 0 and 1, so that goes to 2000. Okay, there you go. There's your 8K. So that's actually the cartridge. So what's happening here is the PPU is mapping the cartridge uh, character data to the first 8K, and then it actually has a 16K address range, which is why it only has thir well, 14 pins. But the name tables are also messed up. So the pattern tables is, is where it gets the data from the cartridge, the, the image data, and name tables is where it actually draws it onto the screen. Let's see, PA8910, so I'm, and remember this is multiplex, so if these lines weren't working, the graphics wouldn't even resemble, you know, the characters, but they are working. So I think what we need to target is A8910, 11, 12, 13, but it's probably going to be, my guess is, somewhere in 8, 9, 10, and 11. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find those pins on the cartridge slot and trace it back to the multiplexing circuit that selects cartridges. Next question to ask would be how much of that is uh, multiplexed together. Oh, where was that? Did I? Okay, so it looks like the buses aren't actually multiplexed at the cartridge level, which they really wouldn't need to be. They probably disconnect the entire bus, so you either are on your uh, program ROM, which is, you know, the demo splash screen, or you're on this. Because as we see, these are all tied together. So, like, if I go to, um, what was that? Yeah, A8, apparently. Yes, A8. And that should, yeah. See, if a cartridge is deactivated, if its ROM is not enabled, then... You can send signals to it, it doesn't matter because that ROM is not going to affect the bus. But you probably are going to have to separate the bus from the PPU. All right, so A8 goes to pin 30 of the PPU and pin 28 of the RAM. 39, 38, 37, 36, 35, 34, 33, 32, 31, 30. Okay. Hmm. Well, the RAM and the EEPROM have the same data pinout. So if I go here, which I believe is ooh, D3 or D2, I want to say. Yeah, that lines up. So that's got a direct connection. So that's directly connected. I'm kind of surprised that it's not beeping out on the PPU, especially since P8 is not multiplexed. I thought it was a direct connection on the schematic. Maybe it's different. Of course, that's a Nintendo schematic, not M82 schematic. So... Pin 23 should be right here. It looks like it's being buffered in some way. Uh, it's probably connected to this chip. There it is. Right there. I'm guessing we go one this way. All right, yeah, so this chip is important. It is a 154, which is, well, I'll look it up. Who knows? Here's the data sheet for that, 541. Right, so what we were seeing, we were pinning out to the Y side of it. So the Y is the output. Okay, that makes sense because the PPU will be driving the address, right? So the PPU will be sending its requested address through the A side here, and then it will be output on the Y side here that's actually connected to the cartridge. Now, along with the other decoding circuitry, there's a pair of uh, 245s, which I know are octal buffers. I'm guessing that's controlling or buffering um, the data and address from each cartridge. 
bank. And I can test that by seeing if the data lines on the cartridge for either, you know, the program bus or the character bus attaches to one of these two chips. So you have to, I have to figure out how this thing is actually multiplexing the chips before I can figure out how to fix it. Oh, by the way, someone re-socketed everything on this board, trying to bring it back from the dead, but I don't think they brought it back from the dead. He clearly still has issues. You heard the beep too, right? I didn't just imagine it. There it is. Okay, another 154. Hmm, interesting. Okay, so that's... Alright, so that's 5 up on the 154. Let's see what that is on the data sheet. Ah, I just checked. So it's got two 541 octal buffers and then two 245 octal transceivers. And the difference being the transceivers, the data can go in either direction. There's actually a direction pin. Whereas these only go in one direction, in one side, out the other, and then if it's disabled, nothing's connected. That makes sense. I want PPU A0, which is pin 29, so we count back. 35, 34, 33, 32, 31, 30, 29. Yes, okay. So it's that one right there. I'm guessing this one is, yeah, okay. So it's, it's all bust together on the cartridge side. Let's see if we can find it down here. So that, I'm guessing that's for the CPU data. So this is probably for the PPU. Yep, there it is. And that makes sense because in the data sheet, that's, I think it's the LSB, right? So if that's, PPU A0 right there. Oh, is it kind of blocked by the wires? Sorry about that. Yeah, going on to that. And then, oh, sorry, it's right there. Okay, so now we can walk up from that. So, so as we go further to the right, yeah, so as we go to the right, it should count up the address bit, so. So let's go to the next one and go one down. Yep, next one, one down. Okay, that makes sense. So that chip is, I'm just gonna write on it. PPU address, and this is gonna be um, CPU address. All right, so this is um, CPU data line zero, and it's going to a 245. Hear that? Which makes sense because a 245 is a transceiver because data can either be read from or written to the cartridge. Like if you have a like a 8K RAM on the cartridge to save your Zelda game. Yeah, that mostly makes sense. Although where are the extra bits? Because we only found eight bits for the address line and then stands to reason this one would be the PPU data line. So some games, uh, like off the top of my head, I think like the original Contra, it didn't have a ROM for the characters. It actually had a RAM and then it would actually decompress data for every level and then write it into the character RAM and then load that up. So yes, your cartridge games did load. <laughs> it's a myth that cartridge games never loaded. Likewise, I'm guessing the PPU data bus is going to be on this chip. Yep, same place. And then what's that little thing? I'll have to look that up. It's probably being used just for switching or something. So I'm just going to... Oh, there's another 245. So I bet if I go to this pin right here... Yeah, okay. Yeah, so it is doing it by section. So like these two chips are the transceivers for this bank of cartridges. And then, oh yeah, I've got it again here. And I don't know about over on the left. No, no, you do have it again on the left. Weird, okay, so if that's CPU data there, so CPU data was, uh, oh, I can never remember this. Okay, right there. So IRQ two over down one. So if we go here, we should be able to beep it in the same place. Yep, okay. Well, that gets us one step closer. 
All right, so we have the PPU data, CPU data transceivers there for that bank. Then we have the transceivers for that bank. Then we have the transceivers for that bank. Now, again, it's not the data lines that are the problem. It's the address lines. But by identifying which chips control the data, we can ignore them and concentrate on the ones that control the addressing. Yeah, the transceivers appear to be, you know, on a fairly normal grid, but the um, 541s are spread out more. I got a couple here, but none here, but then a couple over here. Oh, I made a mistake. That's actually the PPU. See, I just erased my notes. It's easy. PPU A8. Yeah, okay. So then A9. Come on. There we go. Yeah, but that would be the chip. Because remember, the problem is with the PPU address line. So that would be the chip. Okay, so let's see if it's that one there. I've noticed there's uh, 541s all over this thing. Ugh, it's nuts. Well, maybe we could trace that back at least. Mm -hmm. So if that's the output, that means the input's on this side. So... Basically, the bus is only one way. The CPU or the PPU is like, hey, give me this address. So that's only a, that's always a one-way street. So the other side of this can lead us back to the control chips. This could also have buffers controlling buffers. We don't we don't know. Okay, so what I'm, I'm going to flip it over and see where that pin goes. Yeah, okay. It's that pin right there. And where does it go? It goes up to that. Okay, so the connection's good. What is that? Oh, that's the RAM. Okay. That's somewhat encouraging. Okay, that does check out. That is A8 on the RAM. So that makes sense. So what's happening is uh, the RAM and this ROM are connected together because they're on the same bus. And then it also connects to this um, buffer. And if the buffer is enabled, then I would assume also if this ROM gets disabled, then it connects the A8 of the PPU to the cartridge bank. You know, do they have a different one of these for every bank? I mean, they must. You know, it could be lower than A8. It could be... Of course, I don't know if these chips work. Apparently, well, they were all resocketed, obviously, but I don't know if they are actually replaced. So it could be a bad chip, like a bad bus transceiver. Hey, as luck would have it, I have a whole bucket of 541s. Maybe there's a bad one in there. You can try swapping a few out. I have mapped most of it. It looks like the um, PPU address bus is pretty consistent across everything. See, there's it for that cartridge. So that's, you know, that bus is basically across everything. It almost seems like all it's really doing is disconnecting the built-in cartridge and all of these cartridges. Yeah, that's kind of weird, which makes me wonder where the problem is. I mean, if you look at Mega Man, you can see that, you see like the first, I don't know, three pixels of press start. And then in the character set, very likely the top line would be blank. So what is that? Four pixels? So zero, one, two, three, four. So that would be A2 that could possibly be an issue. Okay, I'm going to probe the output of this buffer and show it on the scope. There's PA0, PA1, PA2. Notice how it's not quite the same. <clears throat> oh, that doesn't look good. Something is changing. And just to prove my theory, Let's go to the next one. It's a normal waveform. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. If we think about how a character is displayed on the screen, the lower three bits of the address line is going to control which row of the character you're on, right? So it's, you know, eight by eight pixels. So here's the number, zero through seven. And there's the binary representation. Now we think about it, we're seeing like only half the top half with a letter looking correctly. And what changes at the halfway point? The A2 line is active. And then we also saw that looking strange on the scope. So it could be just that one bit that's screwing up everything else. 
I used to draw character sets on my Atari computer when I was a kid, so I am acutely aware of how this part works. All right, I swapped out the chip, but it's still doing it. All right, so it's not the chip. It must be something downstream. Could it be that resistor array? Oh, there's some more than that. Well, those weren't really runts per se. They were more like uh, voltage levels that shouldn't have been there. I disconnected this from the main board because I was detecting like 200 some K ohm connection between A2 and uh, VCC. So I'm gonna check it now on this board. Oh, I don't even know if I have six fresh AA batteries for the fluke. You know, I might have to like fight the zombie hordes to get them. Look at Castlevania here. You can see the lower rows of a character, but not the upper. See how score repeats the bottom twice? So it seems like whatever's counting, yeah, again, it's like the A2 bit appears to be not working correctly. Kind of wondering if it has something to do with this uh, CRAM A10, which is the uh, mirroring for the RAM. So if you think about Nintendo, there's uh, like two screens. It holds 1K here and 1K here for a total of 2K, that's the RAM. And then when you're scrolling, you're basically going from one to the other. But with Castlevania, we saw that it was drawing ahead but that was appearing on screen. So if the screens are 1K in width, that means A10, the 1K barrier, might be inaccurate. So that could be a likely culprit. What I could do is maybe try a game like Castlevania, which is only using, well, it scrolls horizontally, which I believe means is technically vertical mirroring, if that doesn't really make any sense. But I could manually set the uh, ROM to uh, vertical mirroring and see if that makes a difference. Uh, sure enough, if we open up Castlevania, we see that there's a vertical and horizontal uh, jumper and it's been soldered to horizontal. Uh, something else that's interesting about this is uh, this is actually a RAM chip, not a uh, EEPROM. So what a lot of the old games did was they would actually take data from the um, program ROM and compress it, or it would be compressed here, and they would decompress it and feed it back into RAM for each stage. That way you could have, um, you know, a different boss or different enemy types. So again, your cartridge games did do some form of loading. Don't believe the hype. Yeah, if you look here, it says 64K, so that's going to be 64K bits, which is 8K bytes, and that is the size of the uh, address. You know, I always knew about this horizontal and vertical mirroring, but only now do I really understand the purpose of it. It's basically selecting, it's basically telling it when to enable the RAM, because another thing that cartridges would do is if you wanted to have like four-way scrolling, you'd put another 2K RAM on the chip. Uh, to expand the video memory of the Nintendo. So that was what Nintendo loved to do that. They basically <laughs> force people to put things on the chip, making the cartridges more expensive. So if we beep this out, 20, 21, 22. So that's pin 22. Pin 22 is character RAM A10. Okay, that's what we would expect. And uh, what? So I think these are connected to like PA10 and 11, but I need to double check. Okay, I beeped it out, so um, the vertical mirroring goes to PA11, and the horizontal mirroring, which is selected here, goes to PA10. So that's important to know if I'm going to manually jumper it, just like I manually jumpered the IRQ the first time I worked on one of these things. Okay, I made a switch to manually enable the uh, mirroring. See, it does, it does make a difference, but not a huge difference. But of course, I'm just wiring it directly back to the RAM, if there is some sort of error someplace else, that error is still present, which means I probably need to cut a trace to actually do this cleanly. So I was thinking, what's influencing A10 on the cartridge side if it's disconnected from the buffer? And the first place I probed was the A10 line on the RAM. And sure enough, we've got a match. And it even matches the crappiness, so... <laughs> okay. It's like a, it's like a going down a wild, a wild goose chase down a rabbit hole. Uh, what's that thing called? A s s snipe hunt? You know, that's what the IRS went on after Wesley didn't pay his taxes. I guess he didn't realize that actors are basically self-employed. All right, I've got one lead attached to the A10 line. Our dear, dear friend, Mr. A10. 
like the warthog. And it beeps out right there. But something I noticed, I was trying to find, you know, possible uh, short circuits. And couldn't find any to the left and the right. But right above it. Uh, yeah, uh, that's not good. Look, beep, beep. I'm going to go into, um, yeah, just read the actual value. 18, well, 0.18 ohms. This is 0.32. It's almost like a dead short. What the heck? Okay, well, I guess that would make it a mechanical issue. I'm so glad I spent all that time doing electrical stuff. Well, you know, it was it was fun learning. I'm trying to think. There's a couple things we could do. We could break that trace and see if we could isolate the electrical issue to one of these three banks. Okay, I cut the PA10 trace right below there. So this cartridge is still on the bus, but these three are removed from the bus. And lo and behold, it works. So uh, what that tells me is that somewhere on these three cartridges, there is a short circuit, a near dead short between uh, PA2 and PA10. And basically PA2 is causing corruption in the PA10 line. What I've done is to systematically uh, break and then patch the uh, PA10 line. And I'm pretty sure the actual short is on the 12th cartridge slot. There it is. See it? A little bit of solder just to the left. That's why I want to be really careful with this type of solder mask, because it's not a very good solder mask, really. I mean, once it ages, it doesn't take much. Here, I'll do an example. I'm going to hit that via, and I'm just going to come down here and just, I'm just going to heat up the solder mask, and there, it's done. <laughs> now solder is sticking to it, because this type of mask actually has a um, tin under it. It's like a flow of tin. Watch or listen. That's all it took to break the solder mask. So if you do come across boards like this, uh, be careful because it's, you know, normal soldering techniques where you assume the mask is, you know, masking doesn't necessarily apply here. I'm having a few issues. I've been marking down which slots do and do not work. Although it could also just be, you know, dirty cartridges. So since there actually is a lockout chip on this, uh, if you push the button, it will actually skip over empty uh, slots. So they're just jumped uh, past Castlevania for some reason. Why would you ever pass Castlevania? So basically what it's doing is it's using its lockout chip to see if it's getting a proper response from a cartridge. And if it does, then it knows that slot is populated and it boots that game. Let's play a fun game of The Advice of Body B. Okay, so the graphical glitches are gone, but now these four cartridges aren't loading. So what I'm going to do next is check the um, security chip. Because what happens with this unit is if there's no cartridge present, if there's anything pinged back when it does the security chip, it will skip that slot. That's how it knows the slot is empty. So maybe there's something with the chip over here. I don't know if the chip signals are being multiplexed as well. So the security chip is actually a, basically a pair of microcontrollers. One's on the console, one's in the cartridge. That's what makes it licensed. And they talk to each other on boot, and if the communication is valid, the game is allowed to start. And one of the reasons you had to blow on the cartridges was because the communication between this chip and the microcontroller on the cartridge is actually at a very high speed, and it was more susceptible to uh, dirt and noise. Listen to that great sky shark music, or flying shark in other countries. So here's what I did. I hooked up two uh, test leads to the um, CIC2 motherboard and CIC2 pack. So basically the one on the left is coming this way and the one on the right is going that way. If you look at the scope, let's see, two is... Okay, so the scope only shows activity in the direction going toward the cartridge. No return activity because there's no chip on that slot. That makes sense. Wait a gosh darn second. They had this chip, the 541 over here, but I pinned that out as PPU DAT. Then over here for CPU DAT, they have the 245 buffer. So did they put the wrong chip in over there? I mean, it's a buffer, but it's a different type of buffer. I guess I could swap another one in and, and see. All right, I had to steal one of the buffers from the center column. I put it over here on the... Um, 
third column. Let's see if it works. Getting sick of this music. Okay, there's Mega Man with its uh, <laughs> uh, video bus disabled. Oh, look, it's Mario 3. They... <sighs> it looks like the wrong buffer was inserted. WTF? So yes, these are both octal buffers, but one of them's actually a transceiver, which means it can go in both directions. So the 541, that's the kind of buffer they use for the address lines. That only goes in one direction because, you know, the cartridge is never controlling the address lines. But the 245 goes in either direction because, as I mentioned, you know, the older games would have a ROM on the character side, but newer games would actually have RAM on the character side, so the main program would actually write to the RAM in the cartridge and then also read it, which means you need to go both directions, hence transceiver. I don't know. I should have a 245. I know I have it in surface mode. I don't know if I have a spare dip version, though. Giant wall of parts. There it is. Non-inverting transceiver. Oh, surface mount only. I can't believe I only had this in surface mount. That's the same chip I used on my Z80 note project. And I would have breadboarded it with through hole. All I need is one chip. <laughs> I just need one chip. Okay, I obtained another 74 ALS 245 transceiver. Let's see if that does the trick. Let's fire it up. Okay. Game two. Prisoners of War, which for some reason wants to start with the gray screen, making you think your Nintendo is broken. Lovely. The advantage of Mario Billy. Super Mario. Okay, what's after Mario? Shatterhand. I don't think that cartridge works. Castlevania, Mega Man. That one's being iffy. Okay, I have Contra on slot 9, and it appears to be working. Now, Contra is a game that has a RAM for its graphics, and it actually decompresses the level graphics, puts them into the character RAM. Basically, that means we know the transceiver is working in both directions. It's both writing and reading the program ROM, so that's good. Whoa, according to eBay, Shatterhand's actually a fairly valuable game. I think it's worth using my limited strategic reserve of rubbing alcohol ugh, to clean it up and get it working. A few years ago, I actually went through my collection and sold any Nintendo game I had that was worth more than $80 because I knew that, you know, the high prices wouldn't last forever because the uh, market for those would age out. And now it's, it's, well, you know, it's a 20 year cycle. So we're getting closer to uh, GameCube now almost. Come on, Shatterhand. Shatterhand! It's got a great soundtrack. Oh, let's play through the first level of Contra. You know, I used to be able to beat this game without dying. Doubt I could do that now. I know I can still win it without having to uh, use the cheat code for all the lives, so I can still win this with just three lives, but I don't know if I can win it without dying. Okay, so this is a good uh, game to check the IRQ because the um, checkerboard down there is using the IRQ. So the fact that it appears correctly means the IRQ mod is working. I remember when we were like younger, my sister and I would play this and I can't remember what state, the water stage was at four or three. Well, anyway, that big fish that would come up and eat you, we always called him Butter Bass for some reason. I don't, I don't know why. And then I was like, oh no, I got eaten by Butter Bass. I think you're supposed to kill these guys and then do the run? Because does this, does this respawn the enemies? I can't remember. Okay, it doesn't. Yeah, you know, let's try out this Shatterhand game. Mm. 
Oh, I definitely know what, what character I am. Oh, I guess I have to punch these things to death. So this game fits all of the graphics into 8K ROM, which means you would only need a one-way buffer instead of a transceiver. Now it's time for the worst game with the best music. It's the first enemy, folks. You ever see this game, Time Lord? It's kind of interesting. I mean, it's kind of awful, but it's... I mean, look at this title screen. Isn't that cool? It's got an awesome soundtrack. I'm Zap Brannigan. In the end, they all come back for a taste of the Zappa. Bang! Well, these orbs are pretty easy to find. What's weird and you push up, you go diagonal. Kinda like Qbert. Alright, let's get all let's get out of here. Ooh, I wonder what time zone I'm gonna go to. Oh, okay. Let's go back to medieval times. Where there were no forks. So now the game actually kinda starts, so you have to like run around like doing things and that causes the orb to appear. Well, again, you need five orbs. I think you have to, like, pick all these mushrooms. Oh, yeah. But a lot of it makes no sense. Like, there's a castle up in the sky, I think, and you have to, like, yeah, see if you kick, you go higher. So I'm just gonna cycle through the games for a while, burn it in for an hour or two, and just make sure everything's working. The client said it had an issue where sometimes, sometimes it would work, but if you went around the horn, the selection, the second time you came back, it wouldn't work. I just want to drive this point home. Watch when Mega Man goes up to the next screen and the cartridge has to switch the mirroring technique. Oh, look at that pause. I wonder what that pause could be. Could it be loading of the memory, the screen RAM, because the mirroring is changing? Because if you look, I mean, look at it. Look how slowly the Nintendo can draw in that menu. So when you're scrolling to the left or right or up and down, the system is, you know, doing its best to redraw the tiles before you get to them. And it can't draw them all at once. So if it has to draw an entire screen, there's definitely some lag. And that is a form of loading. Cartridges loaded. There's always loading. Okay, maybe not on an Atari. 2600, but pretty much anything more advanced than that, loading occurs. Let's make sure everything is semiconducting within reason. One of the chips by the CPU, I don't know what it does, but it is a bit warm. Eh, 100 degrees, that's not, that's not that bad. I mean, I could probably put a little heat sink on it. Custom ASIC is cold as ice, Charlie Murphy. I think it's some sort of memory chip. Oh, that reminds me. We plan to have a bad movie night last month when it was April and we plan to watch Cats.
yet. But now with the lockdowns, we should probably not do that. Which means we still haven't seen cats. If you subscribe, you can hear more ridiculous songs. Click the button down below. I'll be here all week. Try the veal. Okay, starting to slowly reassemble it. I put in the proper colored wires for DC power. AC colors. DC colors, AC colors, DC colors, fudge brownies, Angela. Oh, I can also test the excellent Shadow of the Ninja. Another game that's apparently kind of valuable now, but I'm not selling this one. Ah, Trojan, this is another guilty pleasure of mine. It's like a really good port of the arcade, but it's technically really awful. Like the screen's always flickering. And it's always like loading things into memory and it's just really clunky. So this game used a pretty unique mapper, I assume, to load the character RAM quickly for the large sprites. Yeah, you know, I think Apollo's gonna need a stepladder in the fight. Fight Drago and right there in the gut. I'm scared, alright! For the first time in my life, I'm scared. It's a me, Dr. Mario. I'm a gonna clean up the disease. Uh, virus level. Well, let's make this rip from today's headlines. You know, this game is kind of like not good. Oh no. <laughs> my pill bottle has been overwhelmed. The infrastructure crumbled. I do have this cartridge. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Gotta be Starman, of course. Let's see if I remember how to play this. No! Oh, boy! Oh, that ain't gonna work. I was always paranoid about Zelda losing my save game when I was a kid, but now I know it probably would only be a problem if you turned it off while RAM was being accessed. Because see, yeah, I still have my save here with my sword. Ashwarge. I'll take Ashwarge for 800. I'll play your game, you rogue. Well, I'm doing the burn-in, but it seems like everything is working. So there's another repaired Nintendo M82 store demo kiosk unit on the books.